Hello everybody, welcome to this talk on the hidden structures in the Jewish calendar, which I dedicate to Shendel Bas Michael, whose yacht site is today, the day that I record this talk. Um, I would like to build our look at the calendar around Cholamoyed, the middle parts of Pesach and Sukkot. Cholamoyed is not much talked about in rabbinic literature compared to the main mitzvahs of the Chagim. But we will find on closer examination that Cholamoyed is like a building block for Jewish spirituality and a principle that reproduces itself in a fractal pattern across our Jewish year. So much to go at, much to discover. To begin at the beginning, Cholamoyed literally means the non-holy part of the Chag. It is the name that we give to the middle days of Pesach which are not Yom Tov proper, and also to the last five days of Sukkot, which lead us into Shemini Atzeres and Simchas Torah. It is somewhat enigmatic in its origin and meaning, and I would like to look at it in a bit more detail to find out where it comes from and what it is about. The Mishnah Brura at the beginning of Eurach Chaim 530, Tov Kuf Lamed, explains its foundation. There are those who think that it is a rabbinical institution because it is called a Mikra Kodesh, a holy calling in the Torah. And it is a time when there was celebration in the temple. So the rabbis forbade certain activities in order that it should not feel like regular days which have no holiness at all. However, they did not make it as strict as Yom Tov itself. There are many halachic authorities who consider Choramayid to be of Torah origin, and that the permitted things are leniencies superimposed on the default position of Yom Tov by the rabbis, with the authority vested in them by the Torah to be lenient about Choramayid as required. The Gemara in Chagigal, Daf Yudches Omdalaf, 18a, works this out from a passage in Devorim, chapter 16, verse 8 where it says that the seventh day of Pesach is an atzeres, a time when God holds us back from departing, when no malacha, no creative work may be done. The implication is that on the preceding days, some malacha may be done. This is not made clear, as it is dedicated to the rabbis to choose what may and may not be done. So according to this, Cholamoyed is a time when Malacha is in principle forbidden, like on Yom Tov. But the rabbis were given authority by the Torah to permit certain things as they saw fit. Mishnah Bura continues, We are also commanded to honour Cholamoyed with food, with drink and with clean clothes. So let's have a brief look at the laws of Cholamoyed so we know what it is exactly that it is. There are five categories of permitted activity on Chon Hamayid. We may do things to do with Eichel Nefesh, that is normal sustenance and care, things to do with food preparation, and most things to do with personal care. We are permitted to do things where a loss will be suffered if we don't do them, or where a rare opportunity to profit will be lost. We may do things with immediate needs that can be addressed without resorting to expert help. We may do things that are of a communal need, and we may also um, do things if we need to earn money to eat, and without them we don't have money to eat. So let's have a little look at these in a bit more detail, just to find out what's what. The Orach HaShulchan says that it is desirable to avoid using the leniencies of Cholamoid whenever possible. The Gemara recounts that Ravina who was one of the compilers of the Gemara, was particular not to engage in business on Chon Hamayid, and he was blessed in return with extra profitable business after the Chag. Rabbi Abba Bar Mamel, another Talmudic saint, says that Chon Hamayid was gifted to us so that we could eat and drink and labour in Torah. So God's intent in giving us our Chagim was that we would attach ourselves to love and fear of him and to engage in his perfect Torah. And Cholamayid is a part of that. 
El Yorabba says that we're only permitted to do things on Cholamayid to avoid the loss or to take advantage of a passing opportunity to make a profit so that we should not be distressed about the passing opportunity to make a profit or the loss that we might incur and be distracted from our Torah learning. So the frame of Cholamayid is definitely that we should be celebrating the Chag and studying Torah. And indeed, by your joining me, you're helping me do this right now. So uh, let's look a little bit at food preparation on Cholamayid. We may do anything for the preparation of food to be eaten on Cholamayid or indeed the end of Yom Tov. We may even prepare more than what we need if a, this does not entail significant extra work. We may also clean up the utensils after the food has been prepared or served, even though those utensils will not be used again until after Yom Tov. We can also do this professionally. We may uh, work with food, um, if that's our, our profession, provided that it is clear that we are preparing the food for consumption on Cholamayid or Yom Tov or Shabbos that falls immediately after Yom Tov. We may also do things to set up the equipment for food production on Cholamayid, such as fixing a cooker, although we should do what we can before Yom Tov to prepare such things for use if we can. Likewise, uh, all medical treatment is permitted even for the most trifling things. We can take a pill if we have a headache. Um, we may bathe, we may shower, we can wash our hair. Uh, women may put on cosmetics, we can style our hair. All these things are permitted. There are a couple of things that we can't do to do with personal care. The rabbis forbade haircuts, shaving for men and cutting nails so that people would do these things before Yom Tov and look their best before it begins. And we may not even have these things done for us by a non-Jew. Uh, one may cut one's nails for a mitzvah purpose, such as a woman going to mikvah. One may also not do laundry, uh, unless it is for little children whose clothes get dirty frequently, or the cleaning of a specific spot on a garment that became dirty or stained on Yom Tov or Cholom or where, if we don't clean it now, the garment will be irrevocably uh, dirtied and therefore damaged and unusable. We may iron a garment on Cholom to be used on Cholom or the last days of Yom Tov. And there are other things that we may do on Cholom if they don't require professional expertise, such as polishing shoes, cleaning a floor, sewing on a button, However, if something requires expertise, it only may be done in a non-expert way. Thus, an amateur may do necessary home repairs and a professional may do them in an amateurish way. A woman may sew a hem on a garment, for example, in an unusual way or sew up a tear in a garment. A man is assumed to do this in an amateurish way in any event and therefore is not normally expected to try to make it worse than he would normally do it. Um, we can also do um, uh, work on Cholamayid if it will cause discomfort or distress for the thing in question to be left undone. So for example, if there's only one shower in a home uh, or one toilet in a home and they break, then of course um, they may be fixed because no adequate alternative facility is readily available. And even if that requires professional um, help to make them be mended, that's okay. Uh, if a car breaks down and one needs to go on an important journey on Cholamayid or immediately after Yom Tov, one may get it repaired even by a professional and even in a normal way because the alternative would require hiring a car and that would be a major expense. When it comes to avoiding a loss, or taking advantage of a time-limited opportunity to save money, one may work or one may engage in business activities or shopping. If not working, will compromise one's work going forward, or if one will suffer a loss or miss a fleeting business opportunity by not doing this thing, or again, if one does not have money for food. However, one may not take advantage of these leniencies and schedule uh, purchases or work for Cholamayid. So for instance, if not working means that one will lose some or all of one's customer base, one may work on Cholamayid. But if not working only means that one will not be earning money on Cholamayid, then one should not work. 
and one should use annual leave if need be to not work on Cholamoid unless doing so will lead to other less advantageous working conditions. One may write Torah ideas if they will be forgotten or less clear by not being written until after Yom Tov, because that again is something that uh, is going to be missed unless we do it now. One may do a Malacha de Rabbonon, something which on Shabbos or Yom Tov proper is only forbidden rabbinically to make a significant property, but one should spend a portion of the profit on extras for Yom Tov. So for example, if you see a special offer in a shop and you don't think it will be repeated after the Hag, or won't last until after the Hag, one may buy the item, but one should spend a bit of the money one made for the last days of Yom Tov. And if at all possible, we should be discreet about such a purchase. If one's professional life and well-being depend on capitalising on a passing opportunity to make a profit, then one may do so, even if one does not spend the money for things for the last days of Yom Tov. So, for example, if you have, a, let's say, a clothes shop, and all the other clothes shops are open, and if you don't open yours, you'll lose money and you'll lose your reputation, then you may open a Cholamayit. So, why is there this thing called Cholamayit in the middle of Yom Tov? middle of Pesach and the back five days of Sukkot leading on to Shemini Atzeres and Simchas Torah. The Bnei Sosra says that the creation of Cholamayid laws is an expression of what Cholamayid is and that it fits into a larger pattern that can be, dis that can be discerned across our calendar and indeed across all of our lives. He points out that we typically think of uh, things in this world uh, in neat classifications. Uh, so we have the inanimate, we have plant, we have animal, and we have human. But he says that actually a close look at these phenomena reveals that there are blurry edges uh, in these classifications uh, because there are things that cross the barriers with which we classify the natural world around us. So for example, you have coral reefs that are formed by polyps, tiny little static animals, which anchor themselves together into immense colonies, numbering millions that can extend over hundreds of miles. The polyps do this by secreting a calcium exoskeleton, which joins them together. They create formations that look like plants, but they're actually a kind of limestone, and inside them are animals, which spend all their lives just in one place. So it's hard to classify coral. It's actually made of animals, but it's also made of stone and it has the form of plants and it grows like a plant. Likewise, there's a phenomenon in nature which is not well understood called slime mold. Uh, it is much more interesting than its name suggests. It's a colony of thousands of tiny organisms that can choose to work together. They can grow over a common prey such as fungus in just a few hours and exploit it collectively for nourishment. Yet when there is no food source available, the whole colony transforms into individual stems topped by cases of spores, which are released to reproduce and start again, growing as individuals, but banding together to work collectively when necessary. Likewise, in the animal kingdom, there are species which have intelligence and emotions that are similar to our own. Elephants and dolphins can produce, protect creatures in trouble even when the creatures concerned are not their own young or even their own species. Octopi can exhibit the same sort of intelligence as young children learning to open a jar to get the food that it contains, and so on and so on. Bernays Hassel says that these bridges between what we think of as different classes of the natural world express an important and indeed central spiritual reality. And this reality is that at the heart of the reason for human life and the creation of the whole universe, there needs to be a connection to something higher. We don't actually want to have a neat, watertight compartmentalization of God and us. Our task is to achieve precisely the opposite, a connection with him. The word Shekhinah, which is normally translated to mean the Divine Presence, 
is related to the word shachin, which means a neighbor. And our goal is that the shechina should be God being with us as a kind of divine neighbor who dwells among us. We don't want to have barriers. We don't want to have distance. We want to be close to God. And God wants to be close to us. This is what Chalamayid is all about. We had the amazing experience at the start of Yom Tov. And then it's almost as if we're in heaven. At the start of Pesach, we are reliving the Exodus in spiritual form. At the start of Sukkot, we are reliving the joy of God's protection, even in a hostile environment, against all odds and expectations. And at the start of Pesach, the start of Sukkot, all Malacha, except for food preparation, is forbidden. And this is the very quintessence of these days, that we withdraw from the world as best we can, and we are otherworldly at these times. The beginning of Pesach and the beginning of Sukkot are followed by Chor HaMoyed. We still have the motif and the message of the Chag, but we are living much more in the world, because our job is to connect our day-to-day -day life with the heady and ethereal experience that we've just had, as it were, in heaven. So we still have our matzah, we still have our sukkah, we still have our abba minin, we still have the chag motifs. But on Cholomayed, we're bringing the spirituality, the holiness, the meaning of those motifs back down into our world. And through doing this, we make this world into a place that is more ready to be fitting for the divine presence and God is more able to dwell among us. B'nai Sosa says that this is precisely why the definition of Cholomayid is consigned so utterly to human beings. When the wisest, saintliest and most knowledgeable Torah scholars of our people fashioned Cholomayid, they took God's law with God's permission and fashioned this area of Cholomayid for him and for us. They bridged heaven and earth. They filled in, as it were, a gap in the written law. Just like Cholomayid itself is a place where we're not quite sure if it's heaven or earth. So those rabbis were bridging heaven and earth with their Torah. And we bridge heaven and earth with the Cholomayid observance. However, Cholomayid, while it is a hybrid of this world and the next, while its laws come from rabbis, human beings, as it were, defining Torah, Chalmaid is never the ending. On Pesach, it ends in the last days of Yom Tov. On Sukkot, it ends in Shemini Atzeres and Simchas Torah. And this teaches us a further, deeper truth. As much as each encounter with God in heaven enables us to welcome him down to this world, into our lives. So each encounter with him in this world enables us in return to ascend to a higher place in heaven. Thus on Shemini Atzeres, after the seven days of Sukkot, having gone through the seven days of the Sukkot week, we don't revert to number one. We move out of time altogether into a new realm called eight, that's the meaning of Shmini, which means eight day. It's like coming to midnight and instead of starting a new civil day, we start a new 25th hour. Shmini Atzeres and Simchas Torah are time out of time, out of the normal routine of the seven day week that was inaugurated at the start of creation. And on Pesach, we have the seventh day of Yom Tov, when the exodus from Egypt was finally completed with the crossing of the Red Sea and the death of the Egyptians, which constituted our complete and total liberation. We weren't properly the nation of God until the events of the end of Pesach. The Nesiva Shalom says that the seven weeks of the counting of the Omer that begin on the second day of Pesach are a kind of Choromayed writ large. We have the Exodus at the start. 49 days after the beginning of Pesach, we have Shavuos, which is the celebration of the receiving of the Torah. And in the middle, we have the seven weeks of the Omer, which is a sort of long Cholamayid. Seven weeks 
when we try to live the message of spiritual freedom in our daily lives so that we can bring God down into the world. We work through the Sifirot, the seven different modes of interaction between God and us. And then we have Shavuos, which is the natural next step on from Pesach. And on Shavuos, God bends the heavens down to the earth, just as he did to come down to Mount Sinai. And we all join him in the heaven that is on earth to seek his presence once again down here in a heavenly way. Rabbi Samson Raf al Hirsch takes this pattern a stage further still and points out that if Nisan is month one, then Tishri is month seven. And if Tishri is month one, then Nisan is month seven. The months in between can also be seen as a kind of Chodamayid, when we try to bring God down into our world with the messages that we've picked up at the start of each of these times. From Nisan, which is the month of Pesach, to Tishri, which is the month of Rosh Hashanah, we work from being Jews to being citizens of the world, outward looking and seeking to use our spirituality to improve the whole world. From Tishri, the month of Rosh Hashanah, through to Nisan, we work from being citizens of the world to being Jews, using the quieter winter months when nature sleeps to retire from the world and prepare for another national spiritual liberation. There is one more message that we can learn from the pattern of the months. As we have seen, the sequence from Pesach to Tishri, from Nisan to Rosh Hashanah, is not just month one and month seven. It is also month three, which is Sivan, the month of Shavuot, the receiving of the Torah. We find this sequence of one, three and seven with the purification process attained with the ashes of the red heifer, which is sprinkled in temple times on the person who needs purification on day three and day seven of the purification process. Rabbi Sartanov al Hirsch says that day three in this process corresponds to day three of the creation story, where we see the plants being created. Each plant followed its pattern unerringly. The message here is that before we can follow our spiritual path to its end, symbolized by the sprinkling of the water and the ashes on day seven, we first need to understand what our nature is and to commit to following God within that nature, both as Jews in a generic sense and also as individuals. In the sequence from Pesach to Rosh Hashanah, Shavuot is that stage of three. It is in the third month of Sivan, teaching us the electrifying message that our nature is actually to be heavenly. With that in mind, we can move on to Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur and Sukkot, where our relationship with God finds its full flower in pure Simcha. So it turns out that Pesach in Nisan is number one. That is when we begin. We become God's Jewish nation. Shavuos in month three is the expression of our true nature. Just as on day three, we saw the plants in creation following their nature. And on Shavuos, we realize that our true nature is to be recipients of Torah and followers of God. And on seven, Sukkot, that is the climax of our spirituality, when we celebrate our Jewish nature, sheltered by God's protection, symbolized by this Chach of the Sukkot, waving a garland, a bouquet of glorious nature from God with the Abaminim. And since this pattern is laid down, this one, three and seven is laid down in the ritual of the red heifer, the Pora Aduma, that is why before Parashat HaChodesh, the special Shabbos where we read about the new month of Nisan in the run-up to Pesach, before that Shabbos, we have the Shabbos of Parashat Poro, when we read the rules of the Pora Aduma, the red heifer. So it turns out that our entire year, if understood correctly, has the potential to be graced by the spirit of Cholamoyed, assuring us that, paradoxical though it may seem, to have God accompanying us on earth, this is in fact our natural destiny and our natural state. It is something 
that we can do. Thank you for listening. Take care.